Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning as we uh, jump into our ninth session of Second Kings. Um, this will be our second session, our second to last session. That's called the penultimate session. Uh, so we'll conclude our study of Second Kings next week. So next week will be our last session. We'll finish up Second Kings. Um, I am not available to teach next week, so my dad is going to lead us next week. So he'll finish us up uh, with the last chapter. So. Uh, that will be good. Um, as we uh, dive in and look at this, uh, these sections here, just that we continue just to walk through and look at the book of Kings. So um, let's go ahead and open with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts that you give to us. Thank you for the blessings of this new day, our day where we can uh, serve you. Um, your mercies are new to us every morning. And so we give you thanks and praise for for being our God, for being with us, for sending your son. So continue to watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so either uh, online or at your tables, I'd love you to discuss this, the following question. What's your favorite Christian tradition? And that could be as the church, as an individual, as a, bless you, uh, all right, uh, or something else that uh, we uh, you do. I, um, if your favorite Christian tradition. So I'll give you just a few minutes to talk about that. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some traditions today and, and which uh, some of our favorite traditions in the midst of that. Um, for me, I have my personal Christian traditions that I love of just doing family devotions with my family every night um, and ending the day that way. But uh, for me, it's the, the Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter are probably that just holy week. I just uh, my favorite kind of time to remember and recount and just uh, walk through the last uh Last days of Christ's life and then his resurrection uh, before his death and then his resurrection. Just to that too, the hope of Easter. So um, as we look at uh, Christian traditions, we'll, we'll talk about some of that a little bit later and some of the importance of that. Uh, but just as a recap, um, before we dive into chapter 21 today, we've been walking through uh, 2 Kings. Uh, last week, we really looked at King Hezekiah. Uh, king Hezekiah was a good king, if you remember, as we'd walk through that and talk through that. Um, he was faithful, even in the midst of uh, extreme uh, pressure and uh, struggle. Uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, had come and basically destroyed all of the towns of Judah, except for Jerusalem and maybe a few others. His territory um, had really shrunk just basically to become uh, more or less a city-state. Uh, during his uh, reign when Snacker was doing that there. Um, he had an illness. He almost died, um, prayed to the Lord, and the Lord um, get, extended his life and gave him a sign that way. And during the latter parts of his reign, the, the kingdom of Judah begins to expand a little bit. Uh, they never get anywhere close uh, to where they were before <laughs> Snacker invades. Um, but uh, he's a good king. Uh, he does seem to struggle maybe a little with pride, um, and he's humbled by the Lord um, and the Lord um, on a couple different occasions. Um, and there's, if you remember, at the end of his reign or at some point during his reign, there's an ambassador, a messenger, an envoy that comes from Babylon. And he shows him everything, uh, everything in the storehouses, in the treasuries. Um, and Isaiah, the prophet, comes to him and says, who, uh, who visited you? And what did you show him? And he's like, well, this guy from Babylon, I showed him everything. And uh, the guy from Babylon had come. It was one of the princes of Babylon. He'd come uh, because he'd heard about uh, Hezekiah's recovery. Um, and Hezekiah shows him the treasuries. Now, whether or not he showed him or talked about the Lord, we don't know that or not. Um, but he uh, opens the treasuries up and Isaiah says, hey, everything you showed him, will be carted off to Babylon, but it won't happen in your lifetime. And Hezekiah's like, oh, good, that's good at least. Um, maybe a little short-sighted. And then Hezekiah's reign comes to an end. He's a good king. Um, he leads the people in worship of God. He leads lots of reforms and gets rid of the high places. Um, and then we pick up in chapter 21. And I'm going to go ahead and read, uh, read the first several verses here, verses 1 through 9 of chapter 21. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the detestable practices of the nations, whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. 
for he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. And he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, as Ahab, the king of Israel, had done, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering and used fortune telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of Asherah that he made, he set in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Psalm his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander anymore out of the land that I gave to their fathers, if only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen, and Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. So I don't even ask you, is Manasseh a bad king? Because so uh, kind of just describes all that. But how is Manasseh a bad king? And, and so what are some of the things that we hear about Manasseh doing? So he builds the Asherah poles and he statues to Baal. He, he reinstates the high places. So all the other places around to worship besides the temple. What else does he do? He sacrifices his son. Uh, this is either Molech or, or Shamosh that uh, he sacrifices his son um, in the fire. He perhaps him burned uh, that to worship. They would, uh, from what I've read, they would put the, the child, a young child, in the arms of the statue, and then they would light it all on fire. So you're literally giving it into the arms of the, the God uh, there. Um, so he offers his son as a sacrifice uh, that way. Um, and then um, fortune tellers and omens and mediums and necromancers. So basically uh, all the practices of the occult and, and calling up the dead and fortune telling and um, all of these things he is practicing. And not only does he do these things, but what is, where does he put them? In the temple courts and actually inside the temple itself. He defiles the temple with these things. The detestable practices and the gods, he substitutes and changes the, the worship uh, in the midst of that. So that is, uh, that's a little bit about, um, about, um, excuse me, that's um, a little bit about Manasseh and his reign. And then near the end of that section in verses eight and nine, um, the author of Second Kings is kind of preparing us. Right. Notice what he says. He says, uh, um, talking about what God said about this place, he said, and, um, and I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander anymore out of the land that I gave them. If only they will be careful to do what the Lord commanded. But they did not listen. And they did more evil than who? Does it say? The people before them. Do you remember who those were? the Canaanites and the Amorites and all of the people during the conquest, God drove out of Israel. Why? Because of their sin, because of their abominations. Um, way back in Genesis, uh, God promises the, the land to Abraham and to his descendants. But God says, not yet, Abraham, because the sins of the Amorites are not yet complete. Right. So God says they're going to be driven out of the land, not because you all are so awesome and great, but because they have lost the right, the privilege to because of their sins. And now what does the author of Kings tell us? The sins of Judah are worse than the sins of the Amorites. All right. So what's he preparing us for? Then they're them to be taken out of the land, right? Then that's what's coming. They are they have done worse than the Amorites and the Canaanites that came before. God's going to remove them. See, up until this point, uh, they have thought um, we've got the temple. 
God's going to protect the temple. It's our good luck charm. Nothing can touch us here. Doesn't matter what we do, right? We saw that under Hezekiah. Man, the, the biggest army in the world can come against this place and nothing can touch us. We've got the, the best omen, uh, good luck charm, anything ever. We're safe. We're secure. It's so interesting to me that while they gave the Lord that recognition, right? They knew he was they still worship other well, their, yeah, their trust was not in the Lord, though. Their trust was in the temple, right? The, their, their trust was not really in the Lord. It was in the things that he had made, um, the promises. And not so much necessarily even in him. Um, and to him, he was probably just one God among many. But even here, um, you know, some of the, like Ahaz, he shut up the temple right? Um, Manasseh, he doesn't even just shut the temple up. He displaces the worship of the Yahweh outside of the temple. Ahaz, or inside the temple. Ahaz does that outside the temple, but Manasseh even goes into the temple and does this. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, there, it's, it seems to be one God among many, Michelle, but also this idea, you know, that it's really almost a good luck charm. As long as it's here, it's not necessarily faith or trust you know it's more just why should we bother worrying about it you know never had to you know like we're gonna be okay we've got this magnificent temple and whatever we worship there is going to protect us and how long hezekiah had reigned i think it was 39 29 years 30 uh 29 years he'd reigned for 29 years and so um and Manasseh's 12, so his whole life he's seen this faithful worship, but um, as much as Hezekiah got rid of all of those things, are those influences still around? Yeah. Yeah, and Manasseh is, is uh, wrapped up into them. Can somebody in the room read for us uh, verses 10 through 18? I've got the microphone so we can sure hear it on the recording and online. And the Lord by his servants, the prophets, and the Lord said by his servants, the prophets, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all that the Amorites did who were before him and has made Judah also the sin of his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. And I will st stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. And I will write, wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. Because they have done what is evil in my sight, and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Moreover, Manasseh said very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another because the sin that he made Judah to sin so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and the sin that he committed, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his house, in the garden of Uzzah, and Amon, his son, reigned in his place. All right. Thanks so much. So um, the prophets of the Lord begin to prophesy, um, and they prophesy against uh, Manasseh. They prophesy against Judah. Um, Isaiah had already began, uh, begun to do this in the previous uh, generations. Uh, he, he served during Hezekiah and Ahaz um, and, and all the way back to Isaiah, Isaiah served. And, and some of his prophecies were um, predicting the fall of Jerusalem and proclaiming comfort to the captives who are going to be led away. So this is not new necessarily, but this is the first time in the book of Kings 
um, where we get it over and over and over again, right? We get it to Hezekiah, like, hey, you're, it's going to be taken away from you at some point. Um, but here to Judah, this is, uh, these prophets are speaking over and over again. This is the, it's going to be soon. Um, not going to, the Lord's not going to put up with this anymore. You're going to be taken out of the land. And so these prophets are speaking this message. This message, as you can imagine, was not well received, um, not well received by the kings and not well received by the people. Uh, to be a prophet of the Lord speaking these messages was not a popular vocation. Um, hey, the Lord's going to the Lord's going to destroy us because of all the sin that we have done. You guys haven't repented. Have the Lord is going to take us out of the land. You guys are worse than the Canaanites and the Amorites that God destroyed before we came into the land. Right? They all know that history. Uh, and God's going to do to us what he did to them. He's going to take us out of the land. That's the message that these prophets are proclaiming. They're going to be uh, a prey and a spoil. And the, um, the writer of Kings uh, reuses this word. There, there's a remnant will be forsaken. Uh, this idea of a remnant. Um, we get a little bit later in post-exile or post-exilic is what we call that um, kind of the books, the remnant of Judah. Uh, but here the remnant is really the people that are left after Sennacherib and Assyria have done their, their worst, right? Because Sennacherib's already come in. He's destroyed all the fortified cities except for Jerusalem. And he's carted off many of those peoples to Assyria and to their empire. So Judah's already been decimated. Those in Jerusalem are the remnant at this point of God's people. Um, they're the ones that are left. When we get uh, after the exile, there's a remnant that comes back. And that's really, we get this idea of the remnant that God preserves. That's not this remnant yet. That's not what we're talking about here. That's the, the ones that come back after Daniel, uh, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Uh, those are the, that's the remnant that we, the idea we get. And the church now is the new remnant. Those that are left that are faithful. That's not this remnant. It's a different kind of terminology here uh, that we're thinking about. All right. So, um, Near the, um, that's what we learn about um, Manasseh and his reign from the book of Second Kings. If you would venture over to Second Chronicles 33, we're not going to do that this morning, but if you want to look at that later, Second Chronicles 33, um, we learn more about Manasseh. Um, and in that, it describes how he is actually taken captive by the Assyrians for a time. So yes, he's the king of Judah. Yes, um, he has the reign over Jerusalem, um, but Assyria still has power. There's still a vassal state there, and uh, he must have done something the king of Assyria didn't like. He takes him captive, puts him in prison, and while he's there, he repents and calls out to the Lord, to Yahweh, and the Lord restores him. And so he, when he um, the Lord releases, uh, Lord has the king of Assyria release him. And when he returns, he begins worshiping the Lord in the temple again. But he doesn't get rid of the Asher. He doesn't get rid of the Baals. He doesn't get rid of the high places. He acknowledging the Lord, but he's not necessarily, uh, he's repented, but not necessarily fully. Right? So, so he's a bad king and he repents, um, acknowledges the Lord, but he's still not quite all the way where we'd want him to be. Uh, but there is some redemption that, that he has in the midst of that. He was king for 55 years. Um, and as we look at um, Manasseh, Manasseh. So he was 12 years old when he started. And so he's 77 when he dies. All right. So he lived a, a, a longer life. Um, but he's one of the longer reigning kings but an evil king. Um, and so if you think about that, if you're 60 years old, you really, maybe you remember King Hezekiah or your parents talking about him when you were a kid. But I don't know about you, how many policies do you remember from the president who was five years old? Maybe what your parents talked about him, but just impressions probably mainly, right? Um, you don't really remember much about that president. And so there's probably not many people alive who remember the faithfulness of Hezekiah firsthand. All they've known is Manasseh 
and his worship of idols, his sacrifice of children, even including his own, uh, right? And uh, I've heard it said um, that when a, a, a society devalues family and children, it's usually the beginning of the end of that society. Um, and you can look throughout history and Rome that kind of happened that way too. Um, and, you know, we, I think I, when I was reading that, when he was being burned his sons in the fire, we kind of all cringed, didn't we? Describe that practice. Um, it's not that dissimilar from what is legal in our country today and as we kill the unborn, right? It's a devaluing of life, not offered to the God Shamos, but all offered to the God of convenience, right? So there's some, you know, it, it's not a new sin, not an old sin. We devalue life when we, we, we don't view life in precious all its stages and phases. Um, we're not in line with where the Lord wants us to be. And that's a struggle. All right. So let's keep going. Um, yeah. No, it, we don't know for sure how old he was when, when he was taken captive and then when he was released. Uh, and if we do, we, we don't learn that from scripture. I don't know if there's any other places that's recorded, but we don't see that in scripture. Yeah. All right. So let's keep going. Um, we're going to, Manasseh's reign has come to an end. I'll go ahead and read this next uh, section. His son Am, Ammon was 22 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulameth, the daughter of Haruz of Jatva. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh's father had done. He walked in all the way in which his father walked and served the idols that his father served and worshipped them. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his fathers, and did not walk in the way of the Lord. And the servants of Ammon conspired against him and put the king to death in his house. But the people of the land struck down all those who had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah, his son, king in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Ammon and that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And he was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah, and Josiah, his son, reigned in his place. So uh, describe Ammon's reign. What are some words we might use? Short. What's that? Anything else? Not good. Bad king, right? He did evil, just like his dad. Yeah, so his servants killed him. Interesting, though, that the people of Judah, though, killed those servants. So he must not have been a very good household manager and must not have uh, done very good by those around him, must not have been a very good leader. But the people of Judah still saw that it wasn't right to kill the, the king. And so they come and kill the servants and they put the next, uh, his son, Josiah, uh, in, in place there um, as his king. As king. Um, Josiah is only eight years old. So maybe they think they can control him or whatever else, but they make Josiah, his eight-year-old son, king um, in his place. Okay. That's about all we're going to talk about Ammon, unless there's any questions. All right. Can somebody uh, read for us? Verses uh, 1 through 7 of chapter 22, as we read about Josiah. Thanks, Elaine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jadida, the daughter of Edeiah of Bosca. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shelvin the scribe, the son of Azalea, the son of Melchizedek, into the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the great high priest, 
that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, when the doorkeepers have gathered from the people, and let them deliver it to the hand of those doing the work who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages of the house to carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand because they deal faithfully. All right, thank you so much. So uh, Josiah, he's a good king. And when he gets into his 20s, he begins to repair the temple. Uh, according to Chronicles, some of those reforms he actually started earlier, uh, he begins to repair the temple when he's in his 20s. Uh, he's got the, the kingdom firmly established. He follows the ways of the Lord. Uh, he's bringing the people back to, to God's ways. Um, but he begins to do that uh, when, he's, um, when he's like 25, 26, right? He begins to repair the temple. And if you remember all the way back to King Joash, he follows some of the same procedures. Joash repairs the temple in his day, an age after his uh, grandmother, Athalia, if you remember her. Um, who was uh, kind of queen regent and had get the rest of his uh, siblings and all uncles and all those things killed. Um, uh, he repairs the temple after her um, kind of uh, failed leadership. <laughs> and so Josiah here is uh, doing his best to, to lead the people back to worship of Yahweh. Uh, and, and he begins to repair the temple as part of that following some of those same procedures that are there. So Josiah is a good king. Uh, and actually, he's uh, after David, he's probably the, the best king as far as leading people in worship of Yahweh, even better than um, Joash or Hezekiah uh, in the midst of what he does and the reforms he leads. And the Bible uh, talks about him that way. All right. But let's keep going on. Um, verse eight. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the word of the, of the book of the law, he tore his clothes and the king commanded Hilkiah, the priest, and uh, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Akbar, the, or Ekbor, the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan, the secretary, and Asia, this king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me <coughs> and for the people and for the all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So when they're repairing the temple uh, during the 18th year of his reign, they find the book of the law. And, and we're not exactly sure what this book contains. Um, the book of the law, the Torah, could be the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteron uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, if you read that straight through, by the way, it takes about 15 hours. So it seems to be maybe a portion of those. Maybe it was one of the books. Uh, some have suggested maybe it was just Deuteronomy. Others have suggested, well, there needs to be other uh, contained in there because of some of the things and reforms they make. Um, maybe parts of Leviticus um, or, or numbers in the midst of that. Um, or as parts of Exodus. Um, Whatever piece or all of the law it is, um, if you, you do the math, it maybe have seven, it maybe has been seventy five years since this has really been read and studied. Right, fifty five years of Manasseh. You have two years of Ammon, and now we're eighteen years into Josiah's reign. Not that, the, not that none of the stories or accounts of Yahweh, of the Lord and his faithfulness have been read or passed on. 
but at least some of these rights and things that they're supposed to do and the warnings that God gives in the book of the law about their faithfulness or what's going to happen if they're unfaithful, these pieces seem to not have been read for almost two generations. Not studied, not taught. Obviously, it's new to Josiah when he or uh, to Josiah when he hears it. What's his response? He tears his clothes. He's in anguish. He humbles himself. He's in repentant mode, repentance mode. Um, and so, can you imagine kind of not celebrating Easter for for seventy five years? After the time that you pass, I can't, can't imagine the trying to get people to. So how to get back into that when that's been gone for so long, right? And that's kind of what Josiah does. Josiah believes, right? So there's still this belief in this um, people that speak up for the Lord, but it's probably been very watered down at this point. Yeah, you need to worship Yahweh. You do that in his temple. You offer sacrifice. You acknowledge that he created you. They acknowledge that he's God. And maybe that's about all that there is. Um, oh, you maybe keep these purity laws. Some of those traditions maybe have passed, been passed down. But a lot of the details have probably not been read for a long time. We're going to see one of those in specific. It's not just the detail. It's a pretty major piece um, that hasn't been practiced. And, and so Josiah, because he does believe and trust in the Lord, even though he doesn't have it revealed fully, Right. You know, people like that, probably and maybe you yourself have been that way at different times in your life. If, like, I don't know a lot, but I know that the Lord's my God. I don't necessarily know all the details, but I know what Jesus did for me. Right. Maybe you've been like that. Maybe, you know, people that are newer baby Christians that are like, hey, yeah, this is awesome. I love it. This is great. But they don't know all of what's going on. Right. They need to be instructed and taught. That seems to be where Josiah is. Yeah, the Lord is my God, and I am wholeheartedly for him. And where we need to repair the temple. But he doesn't know all the details of what God's done and what God has asked and required of them. And as this red, he tears his clothes in grief and anguish and repentance. Um, and so Manasseh, um, maybe during his reign, as he changes the worship, brings idols in, maybe he gets rid of a lot of the scriptures the scrolls at least one survives though um, but it hasn't been read or studied in probably 75 years is the what kind of laid out for us here and so in, in his grief and distress he asked the priest to inquire of the lord for him but not just for him as the leader of the people but for uh for the people in all of judah he asked them to cry he realizes that the lord's anger is kindled against them um a couple weeks ago, we talked about um, some of the kings, when they became king, were given um, a scroll or given a copy of the law, right? That was in the part of the duties of the king was to know and memorize the, the law, right? And so, so that they would follow in that. Most of the kings don't do a good job of that. Josiah was never given that. That wasn't part of his kind of... Uh, a coronation ceremony like it was for others. Uh, remember that was given to um, Joash when he became king in the midst of those things. And he's holding that. That's one of the symbols that they gravitate to. Um, and he uh, does those reforms, um, but seems to have been lost again <laughs> over the years. All right. So they go to, uh, they, he asked the, the priests, the leaders of the people to go inquire of the Lord for him. So they're going to go and talk to a prophet. Um, and so a prophetess, actually, a, a woman prophet here uh, named Holda. So can somebody read? And if you can pass the microphone around 14 through 20. All right. Thank you. Kathy. Hilkiah, the priest, Ahikam, Ephbar, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to speak to the prophet Holda, who was the wife of Shalom son of Tikva, the son of Parhez, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people, according to everything written in the book of the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. 
Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive, responsible and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against the place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see the disaster I am going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. All right. So as we, we look at this, um, when we the, they go to Holda and, and Holda prophesies and lets them know what God is saying. He says, um, yes, all of those things that Josiah read about, all of those threats that will happen um, that that uh, God promised and God uh, God said would happen if, if you weren't faithful. That will happen. That's going to come to pass. Jerusalem and Judah will be removed from God's presence. They'll be destroyed. But she says, because Josiah has, has been faithful, because he has repented, because he has done what is right, that will not happen during his reign, during his lifetime. Um, that's the, the message here from, from Holda. And it's interesting that uh, they go to the prophetess Holda. Um, at this point in Josiah's reign, uh, the prophet Ezekiel is probably already prophesying and preaching, uh, but this is the prophet uh, prophetess that's closest. So they talk about the, the new quarter or the second quarter of Jerusalem. Um, so if you um, think about Jerusalem, you have um, the old city of David, which is in the south. Um, it uh, is kind of flanked by valleys on both sides. You have the uh, on the eastern side of the city of David, you have um, um, you have the valley there of um, the. Uh, I just drew a blank. Um, it's mentioned here in a second. Sorry. Um, you have the valley of um, Kidron. Sorry, the brook Kidron. The Kidron Valley separates Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and so you have that running on one side of Jerusalem on the eastern side. Um, on the western side, um, you have the, uh, the Hinnom Valley, which runs along the western side and then comes down uh, kind of east to west and joins the Kidron Valley and then kind of goes south and east. Um, you have a smaller valley that cuts between those two valleys, and everything between those two valleys was the old city of David. Um, over time... The, the, the Tyropean Valley got filled in a little bit, became not quite as steep, and the city expanded to the west. Now expanded outside the city walls as people wanted to be close to the action where everything was, but it, uh, houses and towns and or houses and uh, businesses and things and roads crept up all along uh, the western expanse of the old city of David and the temple. Now, at least under Hezekiah's reign, when Sennacherib was coming, they encircled that western hill and kind of brought that and enclosed that inside a new city wall called the Broad Wall. I think I showed you guys pictures of that last week. Um, everything kind of on that western hill, that new building that was called the, the second quarter or the second um, or the new quarter. And this is where this is where she lived. So she was living right there in Jerusalem. They didn't have to go far. It's probably less than a five minute walk from the palace to her house. And they go and talk to her and inquire of the Lord for, for, Hezekiah, or for uh, Josiah. Maybe it's because she's so close. That's why they go to her. But uh, for whatever reason, they go and talk to her and she prophesies this way. All right. Any questions about that prophecy before we get into what Josiah then does, uh, the reforms that he makes as he leads people in worship of Yahweh? So uh, I'm going to read verses one through nine here. Then the king sent and all of the elders and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord and with him, all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets, all the people. 
both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. And he deposed the priests from the kings of Judah, the, whom the kings of Judah had ordained, ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem. Those also who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon and the constellations and all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and beat it to dust and cast the dust of it upon the graves of the common people. And he broke down the house, houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the Asherah. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had made offerings from Geba to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on the left, the ones left at the gate of the city. However, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord of Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread with their brothers. Thus far, Josiah's uh, reforms. So what does Josiah do with the rediscovered law? Rediscovered law? Started to, Start to follow it. He brings everybody together, first of all, and he reads it to them. That doesn't mean that he read every word, but he has it read to them. Uh, maybe he was reading parts of it. Uh, again, this could be the whole book of the law. That would have taken 15 hours. It would have been a really long day. Or it could have been Deuteronomy. Or it could have been selected portions of uh, several different books. Uh, we're not explicitly told what this is. Uh, and there's been great scholars that have kind of argued uh, one way or another on that. Um, but they're reading what God desires them and how God desires them to live. Um, and he begins to follow it exactly as he said, Cecilia. He commits himself to the covenant and he gets the people to do the same. Um, so, Michelle, you're talking about how does he get the people to do this? Well, he begins by educating them, begins by showing them what God has done for them and what God has required them to do. And he leads them the right way. Just as uh, Manasseh and others have led the people astray, he's now leading them in the right way. He gets rid of all of the things. So some of, the, some of his reforms, right? He destroys and he defiles the altars. Um, he uh, cleans up the temple. He takes the idols out of it. He burns them. He scatters their ashes on graves to defile them. Um, he deposed the priests that made offering at the high places. And uh, some of them are killed, we'll find out later, but some of them are just not able to serve anymore. When it says that they, um, when it says that the high priest, uh, the priest did not, of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, they weren't able to serve anymore, but they still were able to be sustained. That was um, um, by the bread that the other priests ate. They didn't lose their income or their livelihood, but they just didn't serve in, uh, the Lord anymore at the temple. Um but he spread bones on them. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But he broke down the, that's in the next start, excuse me. Um, he broke down the cult uh, practices in their houses, the, the cult prostitutes that were actually in the temple of the Lord. We've talked about those that were done at high places before. And Manasseh, Ammon had brought that into the temple, that cult prostitution, that sexual part of worship to entice Bill and Asherah to, to make things fertile, had been brought even into the temple, into its courts. Um, but he breaks down all of these things, all of their places of worship and business, and he defiles the high places, not just in Jerusalem, but from Geba to Beersheba. And so we see under Josiah's reign that his influence and his control of the territories expanded a little bit from just outside of Jerusalem, from just a couple of uh, kings before him. We'll talk about why that is in a little bit. All right. Any other questions there? So you may wonder, well, how does Josiah have that authority to go outside of Jerusalem, right? We thought that Assyria had kind of put that kind of stranglehold on them. 
Even um, his grandfather Manasseh was taken captive by Assyria and then brought back, allowed to be a vassal king. Uh, Josiah here is going into from Geba to Beersheba. So Geba is to the north of Jerusalem on the northern territory of Benjamin to Beersheba all the way down in the south. These are places that uh, Assyria had conquered and had kind of gotten, you know, had decimated. Now people are living in them again, being built back up. But he goes and even goes up to Bethel, which was never in Judah. And he goes to Bethel to take some of the the, the ashes there. And we'll talk about it comes up again in the next section. So what's happening in the, the world stage at this point is during Josiah's reign, Assyria is beginning to lose their stranglehold and their grip. Um, their empire is waning. Uh, from within, uh, Babylon has gained control. So Babylon, uh, several hundred miles to the south of Assyria, has gained dominance and is asserting their authority and power. Um, so much so that during Josiah's reign, uh, near the end of his reign, they actually go and attack Nineveh, the chief city of Assyria, and they destroy it. And so if uh, Assyria is facing this threat from within, are they going to be worried about backwoods Jerusalem as much as they used to be? No. And Israel and, and Judah. And so Josiah is able to exert a lot more control over the land and the area because Assyria is worried about Babylon. They're amassing their armies to, to defend against the growing threat of Babylon. So that's what's going on in the world at this point, which allows Josiah to have a little bit more free reign. Yeah. Uh, I, the gate of Joshua, I think, is the only time we hear about it. Um, and so it just, it, it's just, so there were, when you go into cities, when you go into different places, there's these gates and they were gathering places. There seems to be a significant altar there. He takes care of that too. Uh, that, that's kind of the significance for us as we read it. He leaves no stone unturned. Every place where there is uh, uh, apostasy and idol worship going on, Josiah cleans it out. That, that's really, I think, what we take away from it. Um, yeah. So let's keep going. Can somebody in the room read for us verses 10 through 20? We'll, we'll hear about some other reforms Josiah makes. Thanks, Linda. Um, start with verse 10. Verse 10. And go to 20. Yep. They desecrated Topheth, which was in the valley of Ben Hinnom, so no one could use it to sacrifice their son or daughter in the fire of Molech. He removed from the entrance to the temple of the Lord the horses at, that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They were in the court near the room of an official named Nathan Malak. <coughs> Josiah then burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. He pulled down the altars the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz, and the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. He removed them from there, smashed them to pieces, and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem on the south of the hill of corruption, the ones Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the vile god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the sites with human bones. Even the altar at Bethel, the high place made by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had caused Israel to sin, even that altar and high place he demolished. He burned the high place and ground it to powder and burned the Asherah pole also. Then Josiah looked around and when he saw the tombs that were on the hillside, he had the bones removed from them and burned on the altar to defile it. In accordance with the word of the Lord, 
proclaimed by the man of God who foretold these things. The king asked, what is that tombstone I see? The people of the city said, it marks the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things you had done to it. Leave it alone, he said. Don't let anyone disturb his bones. So they spared his bones and those of the prophet who had come from Samaria. Just as he had done at Bethel, Josiah removed all the shrines at the high places that the kings of Israel had built in the towns of Samaria, and that had aroused the Lord's anger. Josiah slaughtered all the priests of those high places on the altars and burned human bones on them. Then he went back to Jerusalem. All right. So uh, it was pretty thorough. Um, so uh, other reforms he makes, he destroys and defiles altars, not just in Jerusalem, but he does a thorough job of that, even in, within his house on the rooftop of the palace. Uh, within the courtyards of the temple, uh, all over, uh, he grinds up, he destroys the elder, smashes them, grinds them up, spreads uh, human bones, human remains on them, uh, because that was, uh, if something was dead, it was unclean. <clears throat> and so he's basically making them unholy and unclean, unfit for worship now, is what he's doing with all of these high places and with all of uh, these altars. He is defiling them so that uh, in his mind, he's hoping that no one will ever use these places and these altars again for worship of these false gods. Um, and so um, he removes the private royal altars. He takes the altars out of the temple courts, um, spreads bones on them, um, like we said. And then he goes uh, south of Jerusalem. He gets rid of uh, even um, some of the uh, high places and altars and temples that Solomon had made way back in the day. Uh, so it goes beyond the reforms of any of the kings before him to get rid of these detestable practices of these gods that Solomon imported uh, with the wives that he married. Um, and then um, we see that he goes to Bethel, again, outside of the territory of Judah. Uh, he talks about Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. If you remember, every time we get a king, almost all of them are compared either to David or Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So just to refresh our memories, David, the first, you know, the second king of, of, of Israel, the United Kingdom after Saul, and, and as he's described as a man after God's own heart. And so if you're a good king, it means you lead the people in worship of Yahweh. You're in line with, and you walk in the footsteps of your father, David. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, if you remember, he was the first king of the divided kingdom of Israel, of the northern kingdom. When uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam became king, uh, they said, hey, relax the, the workload on us. Jeroboam was the vocal person in that. Relax the workload on us. And Rehoboam said, hey, if you think my father Solomon was bad, my little finger is bigger than his thigh. And he whipped you with whips, but I'm going to whip you with scorpions. And Jeroboam and others, and Jeroboam led them to say, well, forget you, David. Forget you, house of David. We're going to have nothing to do with you. And Jeroboam uh, became the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, politically, he was really wise. Religiously, not so much. He said, if the people of my kingdom continue to go back and worship in Jerusalem, where God has called us to worship, eventually they're going to turn back to the king that's in Jerusalem. Because the temple worship is there, and they're just going to end up unifying that all together. And so he said... Uh, so he, um, in a good political move, an awful religious move, he builds two altars, surrounds them with temples, one in Bethel and one in Dan. And he makes uh, images of golden calves and he places them in both places and says, these are your gods that brought you out of Egypt, O Israel. Worship them. And so the people do, instead of going to Jerusalem to worship, now they worship these golden calves. And this is the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, enticing them to serve other gods. And so if you are a bad king, that means you lead is your people in worship of false gods. You're like Jeroboam, son of Nebat. So you're like David or like Jeroboam. So we've heard Jeroboam's name throughout the book of First and Second Kings a lot. Wouldn't you think they would have heard about the golden calf in the desert? Yeah, but they're they're enticed. They've got all of the you think, right? But but you have all of these other religions that are 
looking around them and, and having these influence around them. Um, we're talking like two, three hundred years. Ago. We're talking. We're talking a couple, three, four hundred years, maybe. Yeah, and it probably was. But if uh, you know the if you don't do a good job of telling your kids about that, you're not teaching them, you're not sharing with them the stories of faith, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm amazed every time I teach confirmation when I'm, we're going with seventh and eighth graders about some of the Bible stories that they don't know, right? Because why don't they know? Because their parents haven't taught them, right? You know, basic stories. So Jesus fed 5,000 people. Yeah, he did other miracles too. Oh yeah, what are the, and they're, they want to know, but they haven't been around regularly. You know, if, if worship attendance once a month is regular now, you don't get that regular rhythm and habit where you get those over and over again. And if they're not doing devotions or Bible stories at home, it's happening today too. Sometimes families come to church, but when kids aren't in a Sunday school or our DBS, right. learning those stories, or and if families aren't doing them at home in Bible stories and devotions and stuff too, it, it it doesn't get reinforced and maybe they've heard it, but they doesn't really, what's the meaning of it? Yeah. Or I, sounds familiar. So it happens today too, you know? And, and so it's the, we are one generation and we saw that with Manasseh, right? Every generation, the church is one generation from dying out. I mean, so it, it takes one bad generation not to tell the next generation. And we don't have the church as it was, at least in the, this location or another location. Yeah, so so that's, so I don't know if that helps on, on that question, but yeah. Can I follow correctly that the original, maybe it was last chapter, that the priest got to still So some of the priests still got to read, yeah, just in that last section we just read. So. So some of the priests that, that maybe offered things on the high places, not all of them are killed. Some of them are, but some of them are allowed to continue to serve or not to serve, to, to live, but not to serve. And some of them are killed at the high places. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them were, um, so they, but they didn't get to participate in or lead any worship, but their, um, their livelihood was not their was not taken away because they were to be supported by the people. They didn't have to, you know, at age 60 or 70, they didn't have to go and find a new way to, to work. Their social security wasn't taken away from them. What's that? And, and some of them here are, are killed. And, and these seem to be uh, maybe some of the ones more outside of Jerusalem um, that are there. And, and so that's, that's there. Yeah. So uh, could have been a different season, a different year. Um, these reforms didn't happen overnight. Um, they're happening over a series of weeks and months and probably years. Um, but he's uh, systematically trying to root out all of this apostasy and bring back true worship of God. Um, and so he goes to Bethel. He tears down this altar that Jeroboam had made. Um, and it fulfills the word of the prophet of the Lord spoken 300 years before. When Jeroboam first built the altar and was, altar and was making sacrifices on it, that's what uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, 1 through 3 talks about. Um, just, uh, just, I'll just go, you can go there if you want, but I'm just going to go and read that uh, for us. 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Um, Jeroboam had made these altars uh, in Bethel and Dan. He's standing at the one in Bethel. And behold, a man of God, verse 1 of chapter 13, came in of Judah Man of God came out of Judah by word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings, and the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord, saying, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign that same day, saying, This is a sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. Jeroboam wants to seize the man as he stretches his arm out and turns leprous. Uh, the prophet heals him. He is able to go in peace. Uh, he's not supposed to eat or drink anything while he's in the territory of, of uh, Israel. 
another prophet deceives him for whatever reason. We're not really told his motivation. Um, and he eats, but he dies. That prophet gives him an honor, honor burial. And he tells his sons, bury me with that prophet. So that's the tomb that's still there in Josiah's day, 300 years later. And they're saying, what's this tomb? Well, this is the guy that prophesied that said you would do these very things, Josiah. Um, so the Lord sees the, the big long-term picture. His word does is fulfilled, if not in the timing we think, uh, it is fulfilled in his timing and in his way. All right. We don't know his name. Yeah. The word of the Lord wasn't what was important, not the name of the man that was there. Yeah. All right. Uh, verse 21. And the king commanded all the people, keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. For no such Passover has been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel or during the days of the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods and the, uh, the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the Lord, the law that were written in the book of that Hilkiah the priest had found in the house of the Lord. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. So the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel. Thou will cast off this city and I have, that I have chosen, Jerusalem, in the house of which I said, my name shall dwell there. And now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo as soon as he saw him. And his servants carried him dead in a chariot from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jeho Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's place. So uh, as we look at and think about uh, these things here, um, so what, uh, what celebration does uh, Josiah lead that whether it's never been done or at least not been done to its fullness kind of ever, what, what, uh, what celebration does he lead? The Passover. And the Passover, we remember, is the, the celebration of the greatest salvation event in the Old Testament. This is where God delivers his people with his mighty hand out of Egypt, out of slavery, and he makes them a people. He frees them and makes them a people for his own possession. And this is supposed to be celebrated as an eight-day festival every single year. And during that time, they're, they're to recount the awesome deeds that God had done for them, for their ancestors, and by extension to them. And they're to look forward to, to how they can extend the freedom that God has given to them, to others. They're supposed to do this every year. And it seems that not since the days of the judges has, has really this been going on. Maybe it's happened some, but not in its fullest extent. Not as this kind of national family celebration that Josiah uh, reenacts for them or gets them to, to do and celebrate again. All right. Can you imagine not celebrating Easter? Right. That's the equivalent, right? Or like... Yeah, and that's the equivalent. It's, it's of not celebrating Easter and having that slip from regular practice. Not recounting the awesome deeds that God has done. Letting it just become, yeah, families might do something. They might not. But that's what's happened for the people of God and the people of Israel. And, but Josiah is like, no, we're going to celebrate this again. And he goes all out uh, in Chronicles. It lists 
uh, the number of animals, uh, the lambs that he has sacrificed so that all the people can do that. He foots the bill for this party, right? Um, for the whole people of Judah and Jerusalem. He's drawing them back to the Lord. Uh, as much as the others entice them away from the Lord, he's drawn them back, recounting those awesome deeds that he's done. All right. Um, talked about their favorite Christian celebrations, right? You know, it'd be like not doing those ever again. Those ones, that, especially the ones that tie us to the salvation, to show us the salvation of Jesus, uh, that he's won for us. And that's the equivalent. Um, um, what will the Lord still do, though? According to the author of the Second Kings, Josiah has been faithful. He's done everything right, it seems, right? Got rid of the high places, torn down the altars, uh, reestablished temple. They're following the law again. But is that enough to satisfy the Lord? These still, the sins um, of his fathers are still too great. It won't happen during his time, um, but he still will remove Judah just like he had removed Israel. Uh, because of the sins and the corruption of the kings uh, that have come before Josiah and to the people. So I'm just, thinking, yeah. I'm sorry. So I'm predicting here, you know, like in my mind, I'm thinking, like you would think Josiah would have made this huge impression on his children. You know, this, this is, here's the book of the law, and here's yeah. the beginning, and you follow this. Yeah. And, and watching him, because we learn from other yeah. behaviors, you know, especially our parents. Yeah, so, so Michelle's kind of bringing up like, yeah, I'm guessing his sons probably aren't going to do what he's supposed to for seeing that the Lord's not going to relent here. Because the Lord has, through a prophet, told Josiah, I will do this during your time. Because of his faithfulness, yeah. And so, yeah, his sons, uh, we'll find out here, they they don't fall in Josiah's footsteps. Yeah. And, and so Josiah's a great king. He's a good king. He's a great king. You know, he's uh, the reforms. He's leading the people there. But it's not enough to redeem the nation. It's not enough to return away God's wrath. Right? There's only one who's enough to turn away the wrath of God. And that's Jesus. There's only one king who is enough, whose worth is enough to turn away the wrath of God. Jesus, Jesus alone. He's the only one that can turn away the wrath of God. He's the only one that's righteous. Um, even despite Josiah's goodness, he can't turn it away for more than a generation. Only Jesus can turn that wrath of God away so that we can live forever free and forgiven and restored. In spite of our failures and struggles, Jesus has taken that punishment. He turns away the wrath of God. All right. Uh, Second Kings uh, 23 through 28. Um, why don't I go ahead and read that too? Uh, did I read that one? So that's what I just read. Okay. Sorry. I did keep going. So what happens to Josiah? So Pharaoh uh, Necho is, uh, or Necho or Nico is going to um, the king of Assyria to help him. Right. So as we read this, we're like, oh yeah, Pharaoh is going to meet Assyria and Josiah is going to go meet them and they're going to have a party. Wait, wait, Josiah got killed. What's going on? Right. No, it's, it's a little bit different. We're talking, um, when we're, we're talking here, uh, Pharaoh of Egypt is going to Assyria, to the king of Assyria. They are going to team up in battle to try to defend against the new growing threat of Babylon. Because Egypt has regained a little bit of power and clout <clears throat> being partnered with Assyria. They don't want things to change. They see this new growing threat in Babylon, and they're like, well, Babylon asserts themselves over Assyria. What if they come down to us next? And so Egypt says, hey, while well, this threat is still far away, let's go and help Assyria nip this in the bud so that this doesn't come into something that's bad for us. Josiah, on the other hand, says, hey, this uh, growing threat of Babylon it's taking care of our Josiah, or it's taking care of our Assyria problem. We've had freedom and kind of a lack of threats, like we haven't had in a couple generations. I don't want Egypt to go and help Assyria, because then Assyria might gain dominance again, and that's not going to be good for us. 
So Josiah goes out to meet him. That means he goes out with his army to meet him in battle. All right. So it's not like, oh, Josiah is there and he's going to stand in front of the whole army and stop the Pharaoh. And they just killed, ran right over. No, he, he takes his army and he goes um, to the, the pass that's near Megiddo. So you have to go through the Carmel mountain range to get from the coastal plain into the Jezreel Valley. So you can get beyond um, into Damascus and beyond up to the Euphrates River where he's going. Well, um, because Josiah's gained some influence into Israel, he's able to take his army around through the hills, be at um, Megiddo, um, sometimes called Har Megiddon, Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo. Um, and there they have this uh, great battle. He's trying to stop them from coming through the pass. Um, and he is wounded by arrows and is killed, we learned in Chronicles, and is taken back to Jerusalem. Uh, where he where he's dead, where he's found dead there, and that ends the reign of Josiah. Um, again, he does not see his country or his people destroyed. Uh, the word of the Lord is faithful to him. Um, it's interesting, um, and we got dive into Second Chronicles a little more, but uh, there the Pharaoh sends him a message saying, "God's ordained that I'm supposed to go up here and help." Egypt, don't stand, or uh, Assyria, don't stand in my way. Um, and whether Josiah doesn't listen or doesn't think that he's speaking for the Lord, um, he goes and he ends up dying in the midst of that battle. Um, so that's what happens. Um, Josiah is dead. He's pretty young. Um, yeah, so not, not super old. Um, and his uh, son, Jehoahaz, becomes king. Uh, Jehoaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was, was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did what was easy on the side of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bonds at Riblah in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and of the talent of gold. And Pharaoh made Eli Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the place of Josiah's father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But he took Jehoahaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land from everyone according to his assessment to give it to Pharaoh. All right. Um, so Jehoahaz described his reign. He reigns only three months, a short reign. In three months, what does he do? Evil. Evil. He undoes all of the reforms of Josiah in three months. Why were the people not revolting? Like, I don't know. Because they're seeing this bad stuff happen and they're saying, well, Yahweh didn't save Josiah. Yahweh must not be the more powerful God. We might, we got, see, the problem was Josiah got rid of Baal and Asherah. We got to go back to them. So as much as Josiah did to eradicate it, did he get rid of all of it? Are there still people that are unfaithful there? Yeah, and they influence the king, and the king influences the rest of them. And so that's what happens. Um, so he's only three months. He's uh, younger than his brother. And... Um, and he was the pick of the people, which probably meant he had like um, pro-Israel policies um, or anti-Egyptian policies. Hey, we're going to pick you because you're going to be for Israel. You're going to be, you know, and he's made king. Pharaoh's like, nah, I killed your dad. I'm going to take you away and makes him go to Egypt. Um, and, he, and so Pharaoh names the next king and Pharaoh even changes his name. And so this is a puppet king, a vassal king of Egypt. And they're paying him tribute every year. Um, and so the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, he makes his brother king. Um, we're not really told a lot of this in scripture, but from the history, we can look. Uh, Pharaoh does go up to um, and meets the king of Assyria there, and they battle against Babylon. And they're trying to stave off the Babylonian threat. Um, but uh, a couple years after Josiah dies, Babylon defeats that combined army and continues to spread. 
Um, so that's what goes on in the midst of that. Um, yeah. So Egypt's in control of the area, at least for a couple years until uh, Babylon defeats their army and then begins to push Egypt all the way back into their territory. All right, so last part here of this chapter. Uh, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, so he was a couple years older than his brother. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebediah, the daughter of Bediah of Ruma, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. All right, so different moms. So, uh, you know, it was very common for the kings to have more than one wife. Different mom than his brother. He reigns 11 years. His name's changed from Eliakim to Jehoiakim. Um, he's made king by the Pharaoh. Pharaoh changes his name. They're taxed by Pharaoh. He's a puppet king uh, in the midst of all of that. Um, so that's where we're going to end reading scripture today. But if you look in the next uh, next verse, we, we get a famous person that maybe we've heard of before. We, we get introduced to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Uh, this is King Nebuchadnezzar with Daniel, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. All right, this is uh, this King Nebuchadnezzar. That's who we get introduced. Um, that will begin. Uh, he's the one that destroys Jerusalem. So that's that's what we're going to talk through and think about next time. My dad leads through the last two chapters um, as we get the downfall of Jerusalem and Judea here. And so just kind of a way of reflection question, we talk about those things that we, those Christian traditions we love. Why is it important to celebrate and remember the works of the Lord? Why is that an important thing for us? So we don't forget. So we don't forget. Pass it on to the next generation. Continue to share and talk about that um, in the midst of those things. Right? They stopped celebrating the Passover. They forgot the Lord's deliverance of them. And how easily they moved beyond that when that wasn't part of who they were. Um, and so even after they only did a few years, it wasn't enough for them to keep that going for a long-term reform. So we, it's important to do that. That's why we gather every week for worship. To be reminded again and again about God's goodness, his love, and his grace. When we get out of the habit, it's so easy for us to forget or fill that with other things and bind to other stories. Um, so that's why it's so important for us to, to regularly do that um, and to remind others of that as well. Um, the Lord is faithful, even when we're not, um, but it's, it's great when we can follow him as he desires us to do. Wouldn't have been great if Josiah never needed to do any reforms because they had never gone away from that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and close with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts that you give to us. Thank you for your word, uh, which you continually use to draw us back to you. Thank you for Jesus, who, who was enough, and, um, whose life that he gave um, to satisfy your wrath was enough, uh, paid the price for sin, bought us redemption and freedom. Lord, help us always to live in, in the mercy that Jesus gives, following you wholeheartedly all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody have a good rest of your day.